What's up, everybody? Welcome to System Crafters. I'm David Wilson, and today we are back in our Learning Emacs Lisp series to talk about how to define and use variables and scopes. Uh, so this is still in the, um, the set of fundamentals about Emacs Lisp, and we are, excuse me for that, and we are basically going to go into now a lot more depth in, into variables and how they're used, because there's a lot about variables that you might not know about in Emacs if you've only done just basic customization of Emacs so far. Uh, so we're gonna kind of go into detail about these other ways of using variables and also about what a, a variable scope is and how that applies inside of Emacs. All right, so uh, we are recording this live. So I'd like to say hello to the people who are here in the chat today. Uh, let's see, we have uh, Andrew here and uh, let's see, and, and Bayant, and Dre. There's Echo, Dre. Anybody else here, Echo? Maybe you have it open in two tabs. Anyway, uh, so let's go ahead and get started. And every time that I start up Org Present, it does that to me. All right, so today, what will we cover? So we are uh, going to cover the many ways to set the value of a variable primarily. We're going to talk about what a variable is again, just to sort of cover that one more time. But we're also going to talk about how you can set a variable using different ways in uh, the uh, in Emacs list, we're also going to talk about how to define variables. So, so far we've been setting variables, but we haven't really, really talked about how to define a variable yet, but we'll do that today. We're also going to talk about buffer local variables because those are actually pretty useful and important in the scope of Emacs. It's kind of a, it's a unique feature to the language of Emacs list compared to other, uh, languages because Emacs is a, a list of environment, but it's also a program that has, you know, buffers and lots of other concepts. So buffer local variables are a an important concept to Emacs Lisp. Uh, also, we'll talk about variable scopes uh, and also dynamic scoping. We'll describe what that is and uh, what it means. And then uh, we'll talk about uh, the let expression for defining variables. And we'll also talk about customization variables because that is something that you will encounter quite a lot whenever you're doing a customization of Emacs Lisp or of, of Emacs. And also whenever you're writing your own Emacs Lisp packages. So it's uh, very useful to learn about that. Also, we'll briefly apply what we've learned from this video to our project. We won't spend very much time on this today because there's a lot of content and it's probably going to take an hour to get through all of it. So we'll do very little on that. But then in the next stream, we're going to go into more depth on the project that we've been working on so far. All right. So um, let's talk about what a variable is. So we've talked about this a little bit before in this series and in other uh, videos on this channel, but uh, let's go into sort of more core detail about what a variable actually is. So a variable is an association between a specific name and a value. And uh, more specifically in Emacs Lisp, this is a, a, a binding, what they call a binding between a symbol or a name basically, and a specific value. So uh, you can think of this like the tab width uh, variable is a symbol called tab dash width, and then that it maps to or is bound to the value of four. So whenever you set a value inside of a variable in Emacs Lisp, you're basically changing the, the binding of the symbol called tab width to the value four or whatever else that you set it to. So in Emacs, there are many ways to define these types of bindings and also to change the values that uh, they're associated with. And uh, this varies based on how you set up the, the binding initially. And there's also a few ways to ch how to, to uh, how to change or there's a few ways to change how the value for a particular value is uh, variable is resolved. So basically, whenever you look up the value of a particular variable, that value may be different based on where you you are in the code whenever you're trying to access that value. So we're going to talk about uh, that as well. All right, so setting variables. I mean, you, you've probably done this before if you spent any time in Emacs, uh, customizing Emacs, basically. If you've been in your init.el file, you've definitely called the setQ function before to set the value of a variable. Uh, so right here, we have an example where we're using setQ to set the, va the variable tab width to four. Uh, but what is that really doing under the covers? Well, it turns out that setQ actually stands for setQuote. Uh, 
and uh, it's basically a convenience function that is doing something else instead, or represents something else instead, which is the set function. So set is the core function you can use for setting the value of a binding. And in this case, you have to actually pass in a symbol to this function because we know that variables are symbols that are bound to values. So in this case, we're calling set to bind the symbol tab dash width to the value four. And if we look at the uh, documentation for this, uh, now th there's something that we haven't actually encountered before, I think in this channel in, in that there are certain functions in Emacs Lisp that you can't use describe function for. You actually have to use a function called describe symbol. And you use that using the control H O, uh, lowercase O, letter O. Uh, uh, key. So control H O gives you describe symbol. And now we can look up the set function, whoops, set. And what it tells us is, uh, it is uh, sets symbols value to new val and return new val. So this is a very simple elemental function for setting the binding for a given symbol to a given value. Uh, also, as you probably already know, we can set using the uh, the value of an expression, the result of an expression. So here we're setting the value of tab width to the, the result of four minus two. So basically all bindings uh, can be set with the set or set Q functions and set Q is basically just the same thing we're seeing right here. It's just, you don't have to use the quote in front of the, the, the single quote character in front of the symbol name because it just makes it easier for you if you don't have to do that every single time, remember to do it. But since we know that in Emacs Lisp, if you want to refer to a symbol literally and not resolve a value from a symbol, you have to use this quote character in the front because that quote basically says, treat this next set of text as a literal thing. So we're, we're treating this as a literal symbol, basically. So um, the one other thing that we, we may already know, you may remember, is that you don't have to define a variable before you can set it. Uh, currently, this uh, value I don't exist doesn't actually exist. If I use Control H V for describe variable, I try to look up I don't exist. It's not in there. You can't find it at all. If you try to evaluate the value of this variable, so if I use uh, Alt colon and type in I dash don't dash exist, we'll get an error saying that it's a void variable. It doesn't exist. So what we're going to do now is run set on I don't exist to set it to five. And if I evaluate that with control X, control E, it tells me in the echo area that it's been set to five. And now if I use describe variable on this variable name, it shows up in this list. And now it tells us that the value is five. So we didn't have to do any pre declaration of this variable. We just set the value and it shows up. And that's sort of the core idea behind the sort of the, the environment in Emacs Lisp is that you can just set whatever values you want at any time. Uh, but depending on where and how you set it, the effect of setting that value or that variable is going to have different different results, basically. <clears throat> so um, yeah, so like I said before, set Q is just a convenience function for setting variable bindings, it removes the need, need to quote the symbol name. So one other thing that's useful about set Q <clears throat> is that you can change or you can take a list of set Q uh, expressions like this and turn it to a signal expression. So basically you can just take all those set Q's out, make it into one big list. And then if you have the, the variable name and then the value to be set for it as pairs in the, uh, the parameters to that function set Q, then you can just do a bunch of set Q's all at once and you don't have to do individual set Q expressions. So this is kind of a nice thing that will make it uh, make your code seem a, little, a bit more clean, especially inside of your configuration files, wherever you're doing a lot of variable setting, you can use set Q and then just have a whole bunch of sets in the same set Q expression. Uh, so that's another way that this, this is actually a helpful function for you instead of just using the, the plain set directly. I don't ever really see people use set by itself. It's always set Q or set F or something else. So just keep that in mind. We're, we're showing you <clears throat> the set function just to elaborate the point about setting variable bindings, but you, you won't really use that in practice. All right, so <clears throat> defining variables. So now what if we actually want to define a variable before we use it? Um, this is what the def var function is for. It basically allows you to create a variable binding and assign a documentation string to it. So um, if you want to pre-declare a variable, like say for instance, if you are creating an Emacs package and you want to declare a variable and give it documentation because someone might want to actually set that variable to something, then this is what you definitely want to use. It also can be useful inside of your own uh, Emacs configuration if you want to uh, document your configuration a little bit better for yourself and also have uh, documentation strings that show up whenever you're you know, setting your own settings. So that can be helpful if you if you want to go that far, I guess. So 
let's take a look at um, the uh, set queue function here. So am I documented is not a declared variable yet. Uh, if we use control HV, we can see that it doesn't actually show up in the list. And if I were to evaluate this now, it will be declared. So uh, the value should be no. So it says, am I documented? The value is no. So now we're going to see that you can actually call def var at any time. You don't have to call it before you ever use set Q. Basically, what def var does <clears throat> is it just uh, adds some extra information to a, a specific symbol, regardless of whether it's already been set or not. So what you do here is you say what the symbol name is for this variable. You also say what the default value will be. And then you can give it a documentation string to describe the functionality here. So I'm going to run this using control X, control E, and it's going to just basically define more information about this symbol. Am I documented? If I use control HF or excuse me, control HV <clears throat> to do describe variable, we're going to see that it's a variable. And also we see now that it has a documentation string. So that's helpful. However, the interesting thing here is that the default value was not applied. It's still no. So the interesting thing about this is that def var only applies the default value to this variable if it isn't already established before the time def var is called. So basically, if you if you preemptively set the value of a variable before it gets declared, whatever value you set there will remain after the variable is declared. This is actually kind of useful in Emacs Lisp because uh, many packages will uh, define variables in their package. And you want to set those values, but you want to set them before the package loads up because maybe the, the value of that variable controls something about how the package gets initialized. So this uh, co happens commonly with evil mode. Uh, there are certain variables that you need to set before evil mode actually gets loaded so that it customizes the behavior of it whenever it does finally load up and configures itself. So uh, this is actually desired behavior in Emacs because you need to be able to set a value sometimes before the uh, variable gets defined. Um, now, there is a way to cause that uh, variable to override the value uh, that's already set. And uh, that's usually for development purposes. And I can't do it inside of this file because we're using a function that needs to be able to parse the, the content, basically. So I'm going to go over to the scratch buffer really quick. And then we will uh, paste this in. And I'm going to use the eval defund function. So eval dash defund. And you may notice that I have my cursor just somewhere inside of this uh, expression. And that's because eval defund will figure out the expression that I'm in and evaluate that. It basically evals the, evaluates the top level uh, expression at the point. So I'm going to use eval defund. And eval defund has special logic to basically say, go ahead and set that value. So if I were to use control HV now to look at the description for am I documented, now we can see that it says yes. So if you are working on an Emacs list package and you want to make sure that your def var actually sets that variable, if you've already set it before at some other point, use uh, eval defund to cause that to happen. Otherwise, it's going to use whatever value is already there for that variable before you try to declare it. So let's see, what else do we have here? Um, so in the end, you would use def var whenever you want to define a document, a variable in your configuration or in a package. Uh, but in most other cases, just using plain set queue is sufficient. Like if you want to create some variable inside of your own configuration, that's not meant to be used by someone else. You don't have to use def var. You can just use set queue to set the value however you want, and then just use it directly. Uh, I do this quite a lot in my configuration. I'll just use set queue to set some variable name that just gets used in other parts of my, uh, my configuration. And I don't really bother with using uh, def var unless as I need to document it for some reason. All right, so now let's talk about buffer local variables. And someone asked about set queue global here. So we'll, we'll go through that in a second. Um, I actually didn't, I didn't prepare for that, but I, now that you remind me, that's actually really helpful. So buffer local variables um, are basically variables that are have their behavior changed so that they can be unique for a specific buffer. And uh, this is useful whenever you have a variable that configures behavior that might need to be different for each buffer. Like for instance, if you're opening uh, buffers with different programming languages, you may need to have different tab width settings in each of those buffers. Like say for instance, if you're editing a C++ file, maybe you wanna have a tab width of four, but if you're editing a JavaScript file, maybe you wanna have a tab width of two. So a buffer local variable will allow you to set this variable differently per different buffers. Um, this is often used in conjunction with uh, major modes. Whenever you have a major mode, maybe, maybe you have uh, a hook that configures that major mode, and then you want to set the value of a, a a specific buffer local variable in the hook for that major mode, basically. 
So uh, this is actually the first example of where we're going to see how the value of a variable can be different depending on where it gets accessed in the code. So uh, whenever you have a, a function that gets run in a particular buffer, whenever you have a buffer local variable and you're trying to access the value of it, um, in that code, it, you don't really have to say, I want to get the value of the buffer local variable. You just ask for the value of the variable, and then it gives you the buffer local value if that variable is buffer local. So uh, it's just one of those those cases, the first case we've seen so far where the value can be different based on where you actually call the code. So um, now let's just look at this example really quick. So right now, if you look at the documentation of tab width, you'll see that it, it is already a buffer local variable. And the way that you can tell this is that uh, it, it tells you at the very top, tab width is a buffer local variable defined in C source code. The, the C source code part's not very important, but we can see that the original value is eight uh, and the global value is two. So I think basically, uh, the original value that was set in Emacs was eight. And then I probably set it to uh, two as a default value in my configuration. However, you can set the, the buffer local value for tab width to four. So if I evaluate this right now, and then uh, take a look at the value for this variable. Now we can say that the value in the buffer Emacs list 04.org is four. So now you can see that when we access this variable from this buffer, it actually is different. If we were to go to another buffer, like let's say, uh, let's look at the, the notes from the previous episode here. Uh, if I look up control HV tab dash width, and once again, we will see that it's, it's the global value of two. So now you can see how a, buff, a value, value can be different per different buffers if it is set as buffer local. So um, whenever you call set Q local, it will make a variable buffer local, even if it hasn't been declared to be buff buffer local. So it's a way that if you want, if you have some customization that you're making in Emacs and you want to make any variable be buffer local just to that buffer, and you don't want to disturb the actual value that's being set in the rest of Emacs, you can use set Q local just inside of that buffer to set that value to be buffer local. So let's take a look at an example of that. So we're going to, um, set a value or variable called some value that does not exist yet. So this is just some uh, some random variable that I come up with. So I'm, I'm going to evaluate this with control X, control E. It's going to set that to two. If we look at the documentation for this, it's going to tell us that the value is two. It doesn't say anything about it being buffer local. However, if I go and run set Q local on some dash value uh, with the, uh, the value of four, if I evaluate that with control X, control E, and then go look at the documentation for this, it tells me now that this is a buffer local value for this particular buffer and it has a value of four. Um, now, I believe that if I were to go in any other buffer, like the, the previous buffer we just looked at and use control HV for some value, it won't tell me that it's buffer local because only that, that buffer that we set it to be buffer local in knows that it's buffer local and it will only, that will be the only place where it has that special value for the, uh, the variable. So now, um, let's see. Now, now what we'll see is that if we run set Q sum value to five, it actually doesn't set that global value in Emacs. It actually sets only the uh, the value in this buffer. So if we run this right now, Control X Control E, look at sum value. Now it tells us that the value in buffer Emacs list 04 is five. But if we were to go back to the previous buffer again and then look at sum value, it's still set, <clears throat> excuse me set to two because now since we have basically in this buffer already declared some value to be buffer local for this buffer, any future calls to set Q will set it only in this buffer. So that's one thing to keep in mind whenever you're using buffer local variables. Uh, and also one interesting thing is that a buffer local variable can exist only in a particular buffer. So right now this only buffer local variable that I'm defining here does not exist. So if I were to look for uh, only buffer local, it doesn't exist in the variables list. But if I evaluate it with control X, control E, use control HV to look for that variable, only buffer local, we can see that it is uh, a value in buffer Emacs Lisp 04. It has a value of may maybe. But if I go over to the previous buffer again and try to look that up, only dash buffer, yeah, it's not there. So basically you can define a variable that is only in this current buffer by using that. That has its usages uh, where if you, have a major or minor mode that you have created and you want to um, uh, set a value only in a particular buffer and you want it to be scoped to that buffer, then you can use this to, to do that. And it can be pretty useful for that purpose.
All right, so let's talk about uh, making a variable local for all buffers. Like let's say we're defining a variable and we want it to be local to every buffer and uh, not have to worry about it. So um, now there is a variable that I'm trying to define here called not local yet. I'm going to run it just, just plain old set queue. It's going to create a global variable called not local yet. And then we're going to use this function called make variable buffer local. And we're going to pass it in the symbol that refers to the variable. So in this case, we actually have to use a single quote to refer to this as a symbol, the symbol of not local yet. And when we oh, let's let's check a look at the documentation first. Let me use control HV for not local yet. And it tells us just a regular variable with a value of T. Now, if I evaluate this make variable buffer local and look at the uh, documentation for not local yet one more time, it's going to tell me that this is a buffer local variable. If I go to any other buffer, <clears throat> excuse me, any other buffer, it's going to tell me the same thing. So I'm going to look for not local yet. And here it's also going to say that this is a buffer local variable. It's going to say what the global value is because there hasn't many buffer local values set yet. So uh, if you are writing an Emacs list package and you want to provide a buffer local variable, this is the way to do it. Basically, you can define a variable using def var like we talked about before, and then we can make that uh, variable buffer local. And uh, then from that point forward, anyone who uses this variable inside of code that is um, for a specific buffer, then it will set that value only for that buffer. But what if you want to configure the default value for that uh, variable like say for instance some other package uh, sets a uh, creates a buffer local variable and they have a value that you don't really like as the default value and you want all of your future buffers to have a different default value well that's what the set queue default function is for that basically says that for any variable especially if it's a buffer local variable set the default value to whatever this is so uh, we have we, we set not local yet before so not local yet has this global default set to T because that's what we defined it as. But now we can call set Q default to uh, to set not local yet's uh, default value to nil. So if I use control X, control E to evaluate this and then look at the documentation for this one more time, it will tell me the global value is now nil. And the same thing for uh, any other buffer. If if any other buffer has not had a buffer local value set for that variable yet, then it will also pick up that default, I believe. So let's check this right here. Not local yet. Uh, so now the, the, the global value is set to nil. So basically it allows you to set the buffer local variable globally for every buffer that has not customized that variable to be something else inside of its own buffer. And... Um, there's one thing that's that you should know, which is uh, there may be unexpected results when using buffer local variables. So uh, if you're calling set Q default on and to set a variable that's like right here, we're trying to set evil shift width uh, equal to the value of tab width. Um, it's going to pick up the buffer local value of whatever that variable is, and you're going to set it globally. So you got to be careful if you're trying to use the value of a buffer local variable to set some other global, because it may have different results based on which buffer that you're running it in. Um, so it's, it's like definitely a thing to keep in mind whenever you're, you're setting these defaults. It's usually better to um, not use a buffer local variable, or if you, let's see, is there a way to get the global value of a buffer local variable? Let's see if there's a function for that. Let's see, global. If anybody knows a function to do that with, uh, we can. You should definitely shout it out. Is there like a get function? Get dash global. Eh. Let's see. Maybe there's a, a control H O. Like, let's see if there's a global function here. Global. Get global. Oh, get default. Yeah, anyway, I can't find it right now, but there's there must be a function to basically get the default value for a uh, buffer local variables just so you can pull that if you want to if you want to be extra safe whenever you're pulling in a value of a buffer local variable to make sure you get the default, then you can use it that way. Um, also, uh, set queue default will create a variable binding if it doesn't exist already. So right now, this will I be created variable does not exist. If we use control HV, it doesn't show up at all. Will I dash? Yeah. And now if I run this, it will actually create that variable. So the I think the thing that's important about this is that you can set the default variable before the buffer local variable gets created. So if a package uh, creates a bu buffer local variable using def var, I think you can set the default before that package gets loaded so that in future invocations, the uh, default will be used. All right, so um, 
it said I, I'm, I'm leaving a note to here that set queue default does not set the value in the current buffer only future buffers well what I really meant by that is that set queue default will not change the buffer local value if you've set a buffer local value set queue default will not change the value of the current buffer because there's already a buffer local value it only will change the value in a buffer that has not had a buffer local value set for that buffer local variable uh, Dre asks, what is F set and set F for? Uh, we're going to talk about that in another episode because set F is um, a helper function that is uh, it does a lot of things. So the, we don't really have time to cover all of that today, unfortunately. All right. So now we've talked about two different ways to define variables. So, so one is just basically setting a variable in the global scope and then uh, also setting a buffer local variable. But there's other way, there's another way basically to define a variable scope. But before we talk about that, let's let's talk about what scope is. Because I keep referring to this concept of scope, but I haven't actually defined what it means yet. So a scope is a region of your code where a variable is bound to a particular value, or maybe not. So basically, uh, in your code, let, let's, let's say you load your init.el file, and you try to refer to a variable just any random variable basically uh, if you are in the top level of your init.el file and you try to refer to a variable it's going to look into the global scope basically just you know whatever is available in the variables of, of emacs um, now if you are inside of a function and you uh, are create a let expression which we'll talk about in a second then you've created another scope so basically that region in that let is a new scope so the inside of that region of that function if you define any bindings uh, to values with variable names, basically, uh, those will take precedence over the global variables. So basically a scope is like a progressive narrowing of the set of values for particular variables. But if you ask for a value that doesn't exist in the, the, the current scope, it will look in the scopes that are above that. So the, you basically have these nested scopes all the way down to wherever you currently are in the code. So, uh, that does dictate how your variables get evaluated whenever you use them in code. And we'll talk about that in more detail in just a second. Uh, so there are two different models for variable scope in Emacs Lisp. We will talk about the most important and common one, and then we will discuss the other one later. So we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in just a second. All right, so, so far we've been using variables that are defined in the global scope, basically that are available anywhere that you try to access a variable in Emacs. Um, a buffer local variable can also be considered a global variable, but only in the context of a particular buffer. So, uh, so you have the global scope, which is basically anything that you want to access in Emacs. And then you have the buffer local scope where any vet variable that has been given a value for that buffer specifically, if it's a buffer local variable, that's a new scope now. So basically if, if you set the tab width variable in a buffer, because tab width is a buffer local variable, this is a now a new scope and any code that runs within the scope of that buffer will get the value of tab width that was set in that buffer. Otherwise, if you're in a buffer that does not have the buffer local value of tab width set, you will get the global value. So it's like I was saying before, you have the more narrow scope of, of the buffer for buffer, buffer local variables. But then if you ask for a variable that's not actually defined in that scope, it's going to go ask for the variable in the parent scope. So you'll be able to get a value for that variable if it's defined in one of those scopes. Um, all right. So now let's talk about, uh, oh, so global variables are great for two things. They may be great for other things. If you have ideas on that, definitely feel free to, uh, uh, to, to shout them out in the chat or in the comments later when you watch the recording. Uh, basically, global variables are great for storing configuration values that are used by modes and commands. So basically, you want to uh, set a value that's being used by some code somewhere, and you don't care where it gets run. You just want it to be set so that the code that needs that value can, can access it through the variable you've set in the global scope. Also, it can be used for storing information that needs to be accessed by future invocations of a piece of code. So basically, if you want to cache some information, like you've run a function and you've calculated some result and you want to store it in a variable so that the next time that function runs, you can grab that value. Uh, global variables can be useful for that, but they're also kind of dangerous for that, for that reason, because if you have these global variables, then your code has less deterministic behavior based on when it gets run. So basically, the more that you depend on these global variables, when you run your code, um, maybe you, maybe three hours later, you run the function again, and, and you keep mutating these global variables, then maybe your code has less, less predictable behavior. So we'll see an example of that in just a second as well. 
Um, all right, so let's talk about using the uh, let expression to define a local scope. So this is in contrast to the global scope we talked about before, where every any, any code has access to every variable in the, in the global scope. Now we're going to talk about making a scope that's local to an expression or a body of expressions. So uh, sometimes you need to define a variable temporarily without actually putting it into global scope or without polluting the global scope. Uh, for example, let's look at some code here that uh, creates a function that runs a loop. And this loop is going to use a variable to hold the index for the, the loop. Uh, so basically, we are going to use a while loop. And we're basically going to loop from 0 to 4 uh, in this loop because we're using the x is less than 5 expression for the loop. If you remember the while expression from back in the second episode of the series, we're basically using the same thing again. So I'm going to define this variable uh, x to be 0 using set q. I'm going to uh, evaluate this function definition to create the do the loop function. And now I'm going to run it. So I'm going to run do the loop. And I need to, to actually switch over to the message buffer so we can see the output of this. So let's go to messages buffer. And now you can see that it wrote out the messages for all of the loop in indices. But what happens if I run this function again? So I'm going to run do the loop again. And now it's going to say starting the loop from five and then done. And the reason why it says that is because we have set a global variable to hold the value of this index. And uh, whenever we run do the loop again, x is already set to 5 or yeah, set to 5. So in this case, the loop is not even going to run because this variable is already 5. And we're just going to see the first message and the last message. So uh, because we use a global variable in this case, our code has different behavior the second time we run it. And it's, this may not be what we intended. So the right way to do this is to use the let expression to define a local version of the x variable uh, for that expression uh, the, for, for whatever is in the body of that let expression so that we can have a temporary version of x that can be can be used, can have its value set, et cetera, without polluting or changing what's in the global scope. So if I were to reevaluate this function here, um, and what you can see is that I've used uh, let, and inside of that I have a, a list, and then another list. We'll see why that is the case in just a second. But you basically have one open parentheses and another open parentheses, the name of the variable that you want to set, and also the value that you want to give to that inside of this let expression. So inside of the scope of this let, x is 0. No matter what x may be in the global scope, in this scope, x is going to be 0 to start with. Now when we start running this code, it's going to start with x as 0 here. And then it will go through the loop for five times like we expect it to, and then it will complete. So if I go back to the messages buffer, run this function one more time, do the loop, we're going to see that it loops from zero. If I run it again, we'll see once again that it loops from zero. And that's because we've set a local scope variable of x to zero. Now, the interesting thing is that uh, this x still exists in the global scope. If we use control HV and type in x, we can see that our x that's assigned to 5 is still there in the global scope. But whenever we run that code uh, that uses the let expression, we are creating a new binding for x to 0. And then inside that scope, we are able to use x. And then when, once that scope exits, then uh, we are, any code after that is basically going to be using the global scope for x again, at least in the context of this example. So um, we can also verify that by uh, adding a little bit of extra code to this function to write out the value of x before we go into this let expression. So if I were to evaluate this one more time, go back to the messages buffer, run do the loop. Now we can see the global value of x is 5, and then we are starting the loop from 0. So basically, uh, as soon as we get into this let expression, x now has the value of 0. Hopefully that makes sense. Please definitely ask questions if you, if you have any more about that. All right, so... So now I, I do want to mention that in the examples here, I'm using the let expression inside of a function definition, but actually you can use let anywhere. It doesn't have to be inside of a function definition. It can be actually just randomly in, in your code. Uh, I'll show an example of that right now. So let's talk about uh, dev uh, defining multiple variables inside of the same let expression. So um, once you start writing code that's not so trivial, you do need to start having blocks of code where you are, are creating multiple temporary variables that are doing things like, you know, doing some pre-calculation or calling some other functions and getting results back. And then, you know, creating a few different variables before you actually do evaluate that body of the let expression that does whatever the purpose of that function is. So the let expression allows you to bind multiple variables in this local scope that you're creating. In this example, we can see that this let is binding y to five and z to 10. 
and we are uh, gonna multiply y times z uh, in the body of the let expression. And like I said before, you don't have to be doing this inside of the body of a function. You can run it anywhere. So I'm gonna run this let expression and see what happens. Control X, Control E. In the echo area, we see now that it tells us 50 because five times 10 is 50. So this let expression is just evaluated ad hoc and the values are being assigned and then the body is getting executed using those local variables. So this can be very useful even inside of your own configuration where, where you wanna just like do some stuff really quickly, but you don't wanna create global variables to store the intermediate values of the computation you're doing or whatever you're running. You can use a let expression just inside of your init.el file uh, without a function and run some code and just be done with it. And then everything's clean afterward. Uh, this also can be useful for um, if you want to override some global variables inside of a let scope and then run your entire configuration with that overridden and then have it revert to the old value afterwards. So uh, we will uh, we'll, we'll see the, an example of that in just a second. Uh, Anders asks, is let run automatically on the argument for a function defined with defun is let run automatically on the argument for a function um you could think of it like that it's actually the other way around um so I, I, let me just tell you something about let really quick um i don't know if it's if it is um represented like this in emacs list but at least for scheme i know that uh that let is almost like having an anonymous function where you have the arguments be y and z and then you you define this anonymous function and then you're passing five and ten and as arguments to the function so you can think of let as like an anonymous function you're defining and then calling immediately with the values that you are providing in this bind statement so so to answer your question anders is sort of like the other way around uh whenever you're when you're defining a function uh when, when you're using a let it's almost like defining a function but without actually seeing that happening um if that makes any sense all right so uh dre asked why double uh, parentheses for let and can the variable in let scope be rebind? Well, we're going to talk about that. So, so the, the reason why we have to have the multiple parentheses is because in let the first form in let has to be a list of bindings and uh, each binding is a list. So it's a list of lists. Uh, in this case, let is a list and it contains lists of uh, variable name to value bindings. So that's the reason why you have these multiple parentheses. And it looks a little bit ugly, but actually it, it serves a purpose. So um, now what we're gonna try to do, uh, let's see what happens when we try to refer to the value of Y that we defined here inside of the next expression to define the value of Z. So uh, basically what we're doing is we're defining Y equals five and Z equals the result of adding five to Y. Uh, or Ramses, we'll talk about that in a second. So uh, what, what happens here is we're going to evaluate this and we're going to get an error. And it's going to say void value variable y. And the reason why is because the let expression doesn't allow you to refer to the values of variables that you have defined as a binding inside of this block um, for future bindings. And uh, we'll, we'll, I'll give you an example of why that's the case in just a second. But the solution for this, as Ramsey's mentioned, is to use let star let star is um, a form of let that allows you to use the previously defined variables inside of this let in future uh, variable bindings in the bindings list so in this case we're doing the same thing basically the only thing we've changed is that we've added the asterisk after let for let star and uh, z is now still asking to make its value be y plus five if i evaluate this the value is 50 because uh, z is y plus five so five plus five is ten times uh, five uh, is 50. One second. So now we were able to use each variable in the future binding expressions inside of that let, which is actually pretty common and pretty important whenever you are doing some of this pre-calculation of variables inside of um, a let expression. So uh, my advice to you is Whenever you're using let and you get an error about some variable being void, it's probably because you need to use let star instead. So uh, just keep that in mind when you're using let. So um, the reason why let star works is because it actually expands to something more like this, where you have nested lets. So in the first let, we define y is equal to five, but then we only bind that y to five in this let. Then we do another let inside of that let to create another nested scope, 
that binds y, a z to the result of adding five to y so let star basically hides that away for you so that you don't have to see that happening but really what it's doing is creating nested lets and that's the reason why this approach for using the values of variables defined in a let or in a previous variable binding works with let star because you're doing these nested lets all right so um, there's a couple other useful macros called if let and when let, but we don't have time to cover those today. Uh, we will talk about that in another video where I talk about helpful Emacs list functions. So if you know about those and you, you were hoping I would mention them, uh, we'll talk about them at, at another time, basically. All right, so let's talk about dynamic scope and what it is. Um, so Emacs list uses something called dynamic scope by default. That means that the value that is associated with a variable may change depending on where an expression gets evaluated. Um, so it's easier to understand what this means by looking at an actual example. So here we are going to uh, set the value of X to five. And now we're going to define a function called do some math. And the function takes an, uh, an argument called Y, but it also uses X. Now, so far we were thinking, okay, X is going to be the one that comes from the global scope, right? Okay, fine. Uh, at this point where X is considered a free variable. So if you ever get any kind of linting errors from flycheck, whenever you're looking at your Emacs list code, it's probably because it's uh, recognizing that you're referring to a variable that isn't defined in the scope of this function in a let or something. It's like a global variable. So it's considered a free variable. So um, now if we evaluate this function and then we evaluate this uh, usage of do some math with the value of 10 for Y, we'll see that the, the result is 15 in the echo area. And that's because Y we're passing as 10 and X is set to five currently in set Q. However, this is where dynamic scope comes into play. If we have a let expression that overrides the value of X to be 15 instead inside of this local scope created by this let, then we run do some math, then the result is going to be 25 because X is 15 and Y is 10. This is what dynamic scope means. Whenever you have a variable uh, inside of some piece of code, the value of that variable is going to get resolved based on where that code gets run and what scopes are currently active. So in this case, we have a local scope that overrides the global scope for the value of the variable X. So when we run do some math inside of this local scope, it will get the value for 15 of 15 for X rather than the value of five. Now, if we were to go back and run do some math here again with 10, if I evaluate this, we're going to see it's 15 again because now we're back to the global scope and we get we get that previous value of five for X. So um, this is something that is a bit mystifying because many languages do not use dynamic scope by default. Uh, JavaScript, at least in the past, used uh, uh, dy dy dynamic scope by default. Emacs Lisp uses it by default. Uh, some Lisps also use it, uh, use it by default, but many other languages do not use dynamic scope by default. They use something called lexical scoping. Uh, Emacs can also do lexical scoping. But we're not going to cover it here because we're going to do we're going to do a separate video that sort of shows the differences between the two and it's more information than what we really need right now it's so what you need to know as a person who wants to write emacs lisp code for customizing emacs or for maybe making your own packages is that in most cases dynamic scope will be at play so this is the thing you need to understand the most right now so um let's see so this actually can be useful for customizing the behavior for functions that come from other uh, packages. And we've actually seen this before in the previous episode. We, we, we mentioned it briefly, but I didn't really go into, into detail. So in the, the code for this project we've been working on or that we started working on last episode, uh, we we're tangling our org files to create our dot files folder. And um, we want to call this org babble tangle file function. Now in org babble tangle file, uh, they're looking at the value of this org confirm babel evaluate variable to determine whether we want to prompt the user to confirm whether we want to evaluate these source blocks inside of an org mode file. Um, however, in this function, I'm using a let expression to override the value, the global value of org confirm babel evaluate to be nil so that we disable prompting. And then when we call org babble tango file inside of this let expression, it will use that value of nil and it will not prompt us anymore. So this is a way that we can set the value temporarily of a global variable so that we can we can change this behavior without having to actually set that global, which is pretty nice. Um, so so like, like I said, we didn't change any global value of these variables. We basically just uh, set them locally temporarily. 
Um, so like I said, we'll talk about lexical scoping in another video because we really need to spend more time like looking at the, the comparison between the two and explaining why lexical scoping actually is better in some cases. And if you want to learn more about that, uh, you can actually go look at the Emacs list manual, uh, the variable scoping section. I have a link to it here if you want to look at that a little bit more. All right. So finally, um, let's talk about uh, customization variables. Uh, you've probably seen these before. You may not really realize you're using them because um, they don't look any different at the at the surface level, basically. But uh, customizable variables are used to define user facing settings for customizing the behavior of Emacs and whatever packages you have in your Emacs. So um, the, the purpose and the primary difference of these variables is that, that they show up in the customization UI, uh, meaning that users can set these variables with a UI, with a user interface, without having to write any code. So if you want to create an Emacs package that can be used by people who don't write Emacs Lisp code, who just use the customization UI, then you definitely want to use def custom to define your variables so that it can they can show up in that user interface. Um, we're going to cover the, these types of variables briefly today. We're not going to cover them in depth because we need to kind of cover the customization UI also when we talk about this because they're very intertwined. So we're going to make a separate video about that at some point later in the series. But for now, we're just going to talk about the basics of def custom and customization variables so that you kind of have an awareness of this and you can use them a little bit before we get into more depth on it. So the def custom function allows you to define a custom variable. So in this case, we are defining a custom variable called my custom variable, and we're giving it a default value of 42 and also a documentation string. So this actually looks very similar to what we did before with def var, where we say def var, the variable name, uh, the default value and the documentation string. However, def custom takes a few extra parameters that you can add to this uh, invocation that give extra information about the variable that you are defining. Uh, for instance, the, the uh, type parameter says what the expected value type is. Now, the interesting thing about this is that uh, in my limited testing with this, it seems that when you try to set the value of a custom variable the correct way, which we'll talk about in a second, it doesn't actually verify that the variable you the value you gave it is the right type. It's basically just used as metadata for the customization UI so it can show the right type of user interface element for changing that variable. So um, this doesn't really give you the ability to do type checking, I believe. I think it's just, just a purely metadata uh, information for the customization UI. Also, you can define the group that the symbol um, belongs to basically because the customization id uh, ui has this concept of groups where different variables are grouped into different sections so that you can see all the variables for a particular package or concept grouped to get together so this basically means that you can define a variable that gets uh, included with some other group that's not for your package if you think that it's relevant to that group so uh, it's kind of a nice uh, feature to um, categorize your your variables that you're defining uh, also, the the options, uh, and it sounds kind of vague, but options actually means uh, it gives you the ability to provide a list of possible values that would be given to this variable. So this also goes back to the customization UI where the UI can give the user the possible values for this variable and they can choose one of those without having to type anything in or, or know what the values are supposed to be. Then the get the set and get um, parameters are to set functions that either set the value or get the value for this custom variable. Now, this can be useful for automatically invoking some code whenever someone sets your variable. Like maybe if you wanted to uh, do some um, back background processing to set up some stuff for your package whenever someone sets that variable, um, you can do this with a function that will receive that variable whenever uh, someone sets your custom variable, and then you can do whatever whatever logic you want. Uh, the trick here, though, is that it doesn't work whenever someone sets your variable using set Q, which we'll talk about in just a second. So it's a little bit risky to depend on this behavior unless you know for sure that someone will know to set the variable the right way. Uh, get is similar to that in that um, whenever someone tries to request the value of your custom variable, it will call this get function to calculate whatever that value is and return it. One use case for using set and get is if basically you don't actually store that value somewhere, but it can be computed somehow. So if, if someone gives you a value in your set function, you can do some calculation to, to do like some background step that you need to do. And then whenever they request a value of that variable, you can do also do a computation to get the, the, the value of the variable based on the current state of whatever, and then they have it back. 
um, you can use it for that, but I don't really know how common that is as a use case. Uh, if, if anybody knows in a package how this gets used, that'd be great if you could tell us in the comments. Uh, initialize is also a function that gets invoked whenever this uh, custom variable gets declared. So it basically can set up a default value based on some different heuristics. There's a few different functions you, you can use for this that uh, are in the documentation. You, sh you should check that out if you're interested. And then also you can set whether the variable should be treated as buffer local by default. So if you pass in local T, it will make your variable uh, buffer local automatically. So you don't have to go and do that make variable buffer local as a separate step. So um, this is actually a, a pretty uh, complex function and has a lot of other things that you can do with it. Uh, I'm not going to cover everything here because we don't have time, but I'm going to cover it in more depth in another episode. Until then, you can check out the manual links here for custom variables and customization groups if you want to read more about that in the meantime. Uh, let's see. Hey, Glenn. So uh, let's let's talk about setting custom variables correctly because it's actually not as easy as you think. I mean, sure, you can just use set queue and set the ver the value of a custom variable, but um, in some cases, whenever these variables have these uh, set functions, <clears throat> they will not be invoked whenever you use set queue. So there is a different function you need to use to make sure that this actually happens, and that is the customize set variable function. So customize set variable uh, takes a let's see, is that Oops, I used the wrong command for that. So control H F. It takes a variable and a value. Um, and basically, I wonder if it's, let's see. Yeah, okay, I need to actually make that a symbol. So if you give it a symbol that refers to a variable, you can set tab width using the customization interface to set it to two. So if I evaluate this, it's actually gonna set that to do and then re return that value. And then custom, customize set value will invoke the set behavior for a custom uh, variable whenever it does that. So <clears throat> it's very important that whenever you are uh, setting the value of a custom variable, if you're not gonna use something else that does it for you, then you definitely need to use a uh, customize set variable just in case to make sure that you don't set it the wrong way and then miss out on some behavior that's actually supposed to be happening behind the scenes. This could be an ex explanation for why maybe you're having trouble with a particular package because you're trying to set a variable to customize its behavior, but you're actually doing it the wrong way and it doesn't uh, set up the package correctly. So keep this in mind whenever you're, you're using uh, custom variables. Now, if you're using use package, which I highly recommend, you can easily set the value of custom variables using the custom section that's a part of use package. So for instance, if I want to set tab width, I can do use package on the Emacs package, which you may not know about this, but you can actually use the name Emacs as a package and it will uh, load this whenever Emacs starts up. You can set the custom section here to have a binding for tab width to two. And this actually will call customize set variable to set that value the correct way so that it will uh, have whatever the background behavior is that's necessary for that variable. Uh, similarly, we can see here that we're setting org, org directory to uh, the root directory notes. So um, this is the, the, the best way, in my opinion, to set these whenever you're configuring a package. Just use this custom section in use package to set them correctly. Um, all right, so how do I know that a variable is customizable? Because I'm saying that you have to set the variable the right way, but how do you know that it is a custom variable that you need to set it that way? Well, the easiest way is to use describe variable, which is control HV to check the documentation for a variable, and it will tell you whether they, the variable is customizable or not. So if I were to go down to this tab width, use control HV, it will tell me, uh, yeah, it, at least here it tells me that uh, customize, it gives me this link to customize. This actually isn't the normal describe variable function though. This is actually the helpful package, uh, which we talked about in Emacs from scratch episode two, I think. Basically, it's a better help interface that gives you more information for the functions and variables that you're looking up. If I were to invoke describe dash variable directly and then look up tab width, which is doing automatically for me here, tab width, then it will tell me, um, yeah, it will tell me you can customize this variable. So if you go and look at the documentation for a variable using describe variable, it will tell you whether you can customize a variable or not anytime that it actually is defined with def custom. Um, so once you once you have that information, then you can go use the right way to set the value for that variable. You can also use this custom variable p function for a given symbol to tell you whether this the variable for that symbol is a custom variable. So if I were to evaluate this with control X, control E, it will return the value of 
tab width. It won't say true. It will give you the value of that custom variable, which is kind of weird. I don't know why it does it that way, but this predicate doesn't return true and false. It actually returns the value if it is a custom variable. So org directory also is custom. So if I evaluate that, it will tell me a function, which is interesting. And then for uh, custom variable P on org file cache, which is not a custom variable, if I evaluate that, it returns nil. So basically you can use this function to determine whether a variable is custom or not if you um, want a quick way to do it. Uh, if you want to evaluate this quickly, you can use um, meta or alt uh, colon to do the evaluation prompt in the echo area. And then you can do the same thing, custom variable P. And then this is really slow. Yeah, custom variable P and then uh, org dash dash file dash cache. You can just ask it right here and it will tell you nil. So that's another way to do it. All right, so we're at the end now. Uh, we're going to just briefly use some of the things we learned today or just one or two of the things we learned today to um, to move forward on our dot files management package project that we started in the previous episode. And basically what we're going to do is just turn those two variables that we had created in the previous episode. If I can pull that back up, lisp 03. Uh, so we were just using set queue for these variables before uh, in the previous episode, but now we're going to make those custom variables so that the user can go set those using the customization UI. So we're defining dot files folder as a custom variable with dot files as the, uh, the, the default value. And then we're saying that the type of that variable is a string. So we know that it's supposed to be just a string that represents a path. And we're also saying it belongs to the group called dot files so that they get grouped together for the dot files uh, variables or package or whatever. We're also defining a similar thing for the dot files org files. And the difference here is that we're saying the type is a list of strings. So we want to have a list of file names basically that uh, is stored in this variable. Now, um, let's look, take a look at that really quick. I'm going to evaluate these two variables so that we can see where they are in the UI. I'm going to run meta X customize to bring up the customization UI. And uh, in the search box, I'm going to type dot files and press enter. And now it's going to, it's going to show me those two variables that I just defined and the current value for those. Uh, so if I were to open up the dot files org files by pressing enter at the beginning of that line, it's going to show me a list containing emacs.org and desktop.org. Now this UI is not giving me any help to edit this list, which I found kind of interesting because I thought that if I said it's a list, it's going to give me like prompts for the individual items. But in this case, it doesn't. Maybe I'm doing something wrong. If you know the right answer to that, please feel free to leave a note in the comments. But um, for me, it didn't seem to help me any here. It does help with other types of values, though. So in the video we'll do on the customization interface, we will go over that so that you can see what that looks like. Uh, finally, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, we'll just reiterate again this um, this let expression that we used before. Um, this is very useful, and you're, you'll use it a lot whenever you're writing your own uh, Emacs Lisp code, where you need to use a let inside of a function to to either override some values for functions, or maybe just uh, set up some uh, local variables for the use in your functions. So not very much of an interesting improvement to this project today, but it will be more interesting next week when we start talking about. Uh, the important extensibility points in Emacs. Uh, more importantly, the major and minor modes, basically how, how do you write a major and a minor mode, and also hooks, because hooks play in heavily into major and minor modes. So when we talk about that, uh, we're gonna do some more work on our package and start to flesh it out a little bit more to make it more interesting. All right. So uh, that's all that I had for today. It definitely rounded up to about an hour. So um, that's definitely enough for one video about variables. Uh, so hopefully this was interesting to you and, and valuable. Um, finally, I just want to thank my sponsors. Uh, these people have uh, been so kind to decide to sponsor the work that I'm doing to make these Emacs videos. And I'm very appreciative and very inspired to keep making these videos because of the support that I'm getting from, from these fine people. So if you are interested in possibly supporting this channel, uh, check out the, the two links I have below in the description. Uh, I'm on both GitHub sponsors and Patreon. And uh, there's also a link for PayPal if you want to do a one-time donation. So if, uh, if you're interested in any of that, please definitely take a look. And until next time, um, we'll be doing another stream on next Friday, talking about the extensibility points, as I mentioned. And then we'll have some other videos on other topics in the week. So until then, uh, uh, thanks a lot for watching and happy hacking. See you next time.